Okay, uh, had a few issues trying to get set up. Let me share my screen uh, and I'll get this talk underway. So it's not running where we should be running in the event. Uh, I'm gonna have to look into that and work that out, but uh, hey ho, these are the wonders of technology. So hopefully you've come over from the event page and onto my main page um where i wasn't allowed to present this for some reason which i'm gonna present now so again i'm you know this is the first time i'm doing this live talk so please bear with me if you've got any questions as we go i don't know whether i'm going to be able to see them or pick up on them uh, but please comment underneath the live video and i will get back to you with any uh, questions that you may have so the, this is the first of a few series, so hopefully I'll be have a chance to uh, iron out some of the issues that uh, I experienced, like posting a video on the actual event page. That would be good, wouldn't it? Um, but uh, thanks for joining me anyway, and we'll get this underway. So it's been a, a, an interesting week or so, and it looks like things are going to start moving forward for uh everyone, uh, particularly as the vaccines are rolled out and stuff. And um, for those of you who are new to me and what I do, I do tours and photography workshops and lessons, uh, all sorts over at walking.photography. Obviously a lot of that has been on hold, but we're hoping, I'm, I'm gonna get an email out this week uh, detailing uh, the walking photography plan to move forward. We're gonna stick with a lot of digital stuff as well for people who still wanna stay safe indoors and wanna limit their exposure to uh, other people and stuff. But what we'll be starting to do is do workshops with very small groups, uh, lessons while continuing to offer digital um, services as well. So uh, lessons over online, uh, virtual one-to-ones, stuff like that. So head over to the website if you're interested in that. So you can see uh, a few examples of that I probably should have moved on to that slide a minute ago but there you go uh you can find out anything about me just uh, go on the website you'll find out any questions you have you can always send me an email or a message on the facebook page as well so let's get started shall we so quite often if you watch any talks or follow any other photographers um and and you see these guys taking photographs uh, over lockdown particularly i'll you know, um, I've just uh, been out in my local area, staying local, taking loads of photographs and they've got photographs of hares and deers and I don't know, wolves and jaguars. <laughs> and it turns out their back garden, their local back garden is uh, a, a massive uh, hectares, acres of land, the size of, uh, you know, whales or whatever. But um, so uh, for me, it's definitely a much smaller than that. It's a little yard. And uh, I, I thought I'd give you uh, a little overview of where I'm sharing when I'm talking about finding new worlds on your doorstep. It really is on our doorstep. So all the photos I'm going to share with you today are all very, very local, all within, you know, 100 metres of the house. And our house is right in the bit middle, bang in the middle of this front row of the house here. And I just want to share some uh, photos that help give you the picture of where I um, where I'm taking these photos. So again, the front row. This is the front row of the house. Uh, we're in the middle there, underneath that night sky. Around the back of the house, actually. So you know, I always get confused with <laughs> the house. We've been there nearly ten years. I still struggle. Uh, this is actually the back of the house, and we've got this lovely green which we uh, run our lurcher Alfie on. And um, and it's really good for things like starlings and, and, and birds coming down and feeding uh, on the insects in the in the grass there as well. So it's a, it, that's a, that's a nice little space that we've got there. There there's Alfie. In fact, when it snows, he he loves uh, running around in the snow uh, on that field there. And again, just to give you a little bit of a, an idea of the area, so there is a, a, you know a nice amount of greenery around our village, Burley and Wharfdale. And um, you can sort of see, so the garden, you can see at that uh, in the middle picture, uh, I might even get a pointer out. Um, you can see our garden, when we're talking about a garden, it is very, very uh, small. <clears throat> but one of the things that really interests me as a photographer, um, for, for a long time actually, before I even moved here, uh, is, is these areas where sort of you get this kind of suburban urban feel and where it meets the nature and, and sort of more organic landscapes, I guess. 
you could say. And, and it's kind of really an interesting, for me, it's always really interesting because we're part of nature, right? So, so in a way, you know, we're completely interconnected with it. So I, I always struggle with this kind of line, this border where man stuff or human stuff meets nature stuff and natural stuff. And because it, it, it's all part of the same thing. And, and, and I think we need to work on that relationship between the two for sure. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that kind of interests me as a photographer and as a person as well. And um, so this is the lower Wharfdale Valley looking towards um Adenham and like you keep going up you end up in Bolton and into the Yorkshire uh, Bolton Abbey sorry and uh, the Yorkshire Dales and above us directly above us is uh Burley Moor that leads into Ilkley Moor and the wider Rombolds Moor as well and again you can see that kind of interest between these human buildings and dwellings and and the the wider landscape there uh, and no matter how urban you think your environment is, there's always something, uh, you know, natural around that you can look at and enjoy and, and discover. And, and, and so it's always worth keeping your eyes out. And when I'm up here in my uh, home office studio space, more often than not, I'm actually hanging out the windows uh, with a camera. <laughs> so if I'm writing emails, doing photo editing, whatever, I'm actually... Um, usually getting distracted by whatever's happening through these windows. Shouldn't have uh, put windows in here because I'd get a lot more work done, <laughs> I think. And just again, to give you a little bit of an idea of the outside of this, uh, of our house, the, the sort of interesting features are these kind of little alleyways or uh, ginnels, as they call them, in Yorkshire and Lancashire in the north. Uh, full of really interesting kind of lines and shapes that you can use to create interesting compositions uh, and, uh, and photographs. And what I want to do really, I want to share with you what kind of started a, a long project for me that's still ongoing called, um, uh, the name's escaping now, <laughs> Revelations from the Terrace. Uh, and the thing that really caught, drew me into this project that's developed and grown is is the starlings that gather on the roofs around us and, and nest and um uh and feed and you know do all sorts cause chaos sometimes as well uh and uh they they, they really caught my attention and, and imagination so if you indulge me i'll share with you some of my experiences with these starlings and it's a, really it's an example of how just picking up on one thing can lead into a whole avenue of thought and creativity and taking photographs so, so you could just choose one thing if you if you go out this week and you find uh you notice uh pigeons uh you notice um seagulls or it could be ducks that are in your local pond whatever it is uh you know, run with that and, and see where it takes you because it's really interesting to see how things change and develop over over time and, and that's certainly what's happened with uh, these starlings and my investigation into our local starlings so you know again as I said they really caught my attention from the roofs from the from here like uh, I would peek out and and see them as the sun's going down or whatever they're really noisy birds as well they make some great uh, noises they're great mimics as well they can mimic lots of things they've been recorded uh, mimicking car alarms, phone ringtones, uh, all sorts of stuff. And you can look up online. Some of the things are even quite funny that they've caused uh, issues like a, I think they caused a penalty, a, a football match once imitating the referee's uh, football whistle. And yeah, they're great. They, they just uh, have these little battles on TV masts and stuff and they fly around. And as I said, they come down on the grass at the back of the house as well to feed and, and uh, look around. But they also come into the gardens. There's lots of bird feeders around uh, the houses around me and they'll come down uh, and raid those um, bird feeders as well. Around this time of year, in a few weeks, maybe, they'll start stop flocking together so much and they'll start pairing off and you'll see a lot of chasing each other around and and um, and sort of uh, getting a bit boisterous and and chasing each other off and away and, 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 and flirting as well, uh, it has to be said as well. Uh, here they are kind of post flirting, I guess, uh, on the grass and in the chimneys. It doesn't seem to bother them too much where. And then 
they will start to nest and we were lucky on our road to have a couple of nests you can see this here is a, a nest that's been active for a few years now that i see them every every year they all nest in this little hole there and breed some young uh, and it's not just um, in the chimneys there's a little bit under the eaves as well uh, where they can nest and uh, so this is one parent above a nest in which is actually under the eaves of the roof here which is uh, cool so it shows you a little bit of variation where they can nest now obviously uh, with new builds when people get their roofs done uh, that's a nest uh, site gone if there was one there and, and I think that's a big contribution these uh, losing those nest cavities in chimneys and, and roofs uh, to the 66 percent decline we've seen in Stalin's since 19 since the mid 70s mid 1970s a 66 percent decline in our starlings which I, I think will be largely down to this kind of um, losing habitat uh, and nesting spaces in in, in roofs and, and houses and chimneys and things like that and this is what a young juvenile looks like um, nothing too spectacular but still quite lovable I think and um, as they get a bit older, they kind of look a little bit weirder. They get, get a kind of almost like a pinstripe suit, you know, a city worker suit with a kind of weird gray brown uh, shabby head, <laughs> which is kind of a bit crazy. But, but towards the end of the summer, well, you can see the change that will happen. So they go uh, from having a yellow beak and, and, and this uh, coat to a, 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 a stronger coat, I think, a more starred uh, coat and, and this dark beak that you see here and they'll start to gather together as well towards the end of the summer and then the beginning of the autumn and and in th in this area where our houses are um they'll, they'll be gathering at their most their peak will be at the end of the summer beginning of the autumn as they start to get ready some of them will go off and join other groups and stuff and they'll all group together and they'll raid the berries on the local trees here and then run off to the safety of the roofs and the chimneys and um, they'll hang around until they've stripped all the trees around and um, and, and then uh, that's that's their peak numbers for us here and you can see a shot here of the kind of numbers you can expect um, sometimes uh, good numbers there when they all come and gather and raid some of the trees around locally and then they'll start to get into smaller groups as the winter goes on and then the cycle goes again but I have to say I have noticed a drop in the numbers in our local starlings each year at each part of this this phase that I've uh, just shared with you but looking at this photo moves, moves me on to another part so that one of the things you can do to discover new worlds if you can find a species it's really that, that you can see and watch all year round it's a really rewarding thing to do because you create that really um uh, intimate kind of intricate knowledge that you can have and, and you can sort of start to gauge and understand what's happening with them what what's working for them what's not working for them and it's a really uh, powerful thing uh, and, a, and an enjoyable thing to do but what I want to do now is move on to the ideas of skies because no matter where you live whether you live in a grand mansion or in a flat you can always enjoy um skies wherever you are and there's something quite liberating about looking at the skies skies have always influenced my work particularly uh, landscape work i love uh, strong dramatic skies and uh, and there's something really kind of liberating about looking at skies and it's something everyone can do so looking at the clouds and how that change is and again like with the starlings if you live locally and you stay looking locally you can see how the light changes the environment around you day to day, week to week, uh, month to month throughout the year. And you can you start to get this kind of real intimate knowledge of how that works. And that can really help influence how you photograph things. So, you know, if you if there's a plant in your garden that looks really good at a certain time of day and then a certain time of year, and you can start to understand how all these kind of different timings and light situations add or subtract from the photograph that you want to achieve so looking at skies looking at the light how the sun comes down is a really great thing to understand and and, and learn and, and it's very 
practical thing you don't have you don't even have to have a camera you can observe it all the time and just make mental notes of what looks oh that looks good at this time of day and this time of year so it's a great thing to to start to do and then you know you can start to find the other great thing about skies is you can find really unique moments they're very subjective as well quite often you know you might see things in the clouds that uh, that uh, you you know if you're a dog lover you usually see a dog in the cloud and if you're a cat lover you see a cat in the cloud whatever so uh, you know that kind of you know you can really help people's imaginations go wild when you sort of move remove context i guess like remove identifiable objects and just looking at the skies and the clouds people can just sort of get lost in those skies and that's one of the great things about skies you can also use features in your house so here's a this is a, just a reflection on our uh, roof window there of the blue sky hitting it there and uh, who doesn't love a sunset right yeah <laughs> And sometimes, you know, you watch enough sunsets, sometimes you get really unique and special sunsets. And that's one of the things is, again, it's like, again, repeating the process of looking up and looking at trying to catch a sunset every day. Then you start to recognize which ones are the really special ones as well, which can be quite useful. And it doesn't have to just be at the, the sunrise, sunsets in the middle of the day or whatever. Night skies are particularly brilliant and you know you might think um people in the countryside get really good skies we're really close to leeds we get a lot of light pollution from leeds and bradford as well we're near bradford just on the other side of the moor so we get a lot of light pollution but you can still create interesting images with night photography you can still create cool stuff it's what it's about it's not about trying to emulate you know someone i don't know in the middle of nowhere with a massive um, Milky Way shot. It's about seeing what's in front of you, recognizing it, and getting the best from it. You know, that's that that's the key, I think. And um, uh, and sort of seeing that. Obviously, night photography can be a bit specialist, so you might uh, might want to think about what you can do with the equipment that you've got as well. But one thing we can all do is we can all start to look at things that are changing all the time and one of the things that's changing now and in in the coming weeks is the blossoms and flowers starting to come up and one of the ways we can enjoy that is by getting closer to them and um, the, the closer you get to something the more you focus on that subject and the more you can play with it so the key that whenever I'm talking about getting close up and and going in for details and stuff the key is to think about that background and make sure there's nothing in the background uh, that's too distracting and the closer you get usually the more you can blur out that background as well which can also help now you can in, when you're looking at getting close up to things like plants and flowers and things that you can do this with any camera you like but there is all the lenses and cameras will all have different uh, minimum focus distances so you know some lenses might only get that close others might you might only be able to do that one or, or that but one thing you can do if you've got a lens you can use extension tubes which are pretty cheap for a DSLR you can use screw on filters that allow you to get closer up you can even hold a magnifying glass in front of your lens if you've got a, and, and a phone if you've got a phone but if well, with my phone photography uh, if I'm getting close I've got a little clip on pretty inexpensive from Amazon I've got a clip on uh, macro lens that just goes on top of the phone and that allows me to get closer up to whatever it is I'm photographing and believe it or not this is a phone photograph there for you so you can see that you can still take great photographs with your phone uh, by putting these um, little uh, magnifying lenses on on the end so you can get magnetic ones as well as uh, clip on ones so uh, just have a look at the reviews on on whatever shopping site you want to use or just use a magnifying glass as well that's just as good so once you start photographing flowers you might start to want to photograph the life that is in and around and uses those flowers as well and you can start to create interesting shots uh, of and, and observe the life that's in your garden and you can see here um you can start to take it a little bit further and try and start trying to capture 
uh, insects and bees and things in flight, which can be a really exciting challenge. Now, the thing with that is uh, I only ever show you the ones that work or that I like, but you know, you can take hundreds and hundreds of photos uh, and not uh, until you get the, the right one or one that you're happy with. And that's not something to be, um, annoyed or stressed about that's something to enjoy to enjoy that process because it takes 100 200 500 photos if you get that one that works that's great and, it, and it's the work that's gone into it that gives you that satisfaction and before you know it you've uh, spent a whole afternoon uh, feeling you know really positive about the process of photographing something and, and, and achieving that as well now getting quite close up and trying to get a bee in flight is a very tricky thing. So one of the things that you might want to try doing uh, is actually stepping back. So this is quite a good technique here. You find a, a flower that is frequented by bees. Uh, so bees are obviously enjoying it. Uh, and then you get your camera set up. You can either hand hold it with a phone or you could set a tripod up, focus on the flower and then wait for the bee to come and then take the picture. And, and by stepping back a little bit and using a little bit of space, because there's no, nothing going on in the background, it's a nice simple shot and, and you can see what the photo is about. So when you're starting out, if you're starting out doing stuff like that, take a couple of steps back, find a nice sort of clear uh, plain background and then photograph as the bee comes in or whatever, a butterfly could be a butterfly as well here. So whatever it is, just get, by get, taking a couple of steps back, you give yourself, a little, make it a little bit easier for yourself and you can still have a really nice striking image as well. Again here, like the, here's the idea is um, waiting uh, for a bee to come into the frame of, of, this, of this gap in a hedge as a, in the early morning sun. So it's a similar technique used uh, there. As well as getting close, you can start to think about things like color. So color is a really uh, powerful thing to use in photography. And, and, and as color arrives, especially after winter, uh, when we start to see color, it can be really powerful and, and really get our emotions going and, and get us inspired and stuff. So using uh, color to uh, create emotions and feelings is it can be a really great thing to do. You know, you can even go for that bright, vibrant thing that we we're looking or you can try and get a single tone of color and, and you know, just play with that and, and explore that. Just just being mentally aware of that will sort of help lift those photographs and help you think and look for things. You might start thinking, right, if I want a yellow background for the bee, I need to find make sure that there's not that pink flowers out of the background, etc. So it's just that process of thinking about things and and, and arranging yourself and, and that's a really nice positive thing to do as well and you might find if you're lucky if you've got a pond uh, you you might find you get some really exciting visitors we haven't got a pond massively near us but we did have uh, a damselfly visit us which was I was really surprised I think the closest we've got uh, the river and we've got a pond but you know it's still fairly far away so I was really surprised to see damsels and, and then and again the more you get to know your area the more you know when there's something special that's visiting or you know that that kind of thing so uh, you know when something's arrived that's unusual and, and it's quite cool to see and the closer you look especially when we're looking close up the more you notice as well and sometimes you don't even notice when you until you come back and look at the photos afterwards as well but i was photographing a bee and then I didn't even notice this guy until I looked back. I was still in situ looking back at the photo, seeing if I'd managed to got the bee. And then I noticed that this crab spider here was just sitting there um, waiting and, and that they'll actually pounce on, on uh, bees and, and grab them and flies or, or whatever it is and, uh, and try and eat them. And uh, so I spent a bit longer time trying to see if I could get an action shot of it, uh, catching a bee or something. And uh, it, I didn't, um, it didn't make a successful, uh, it did make a couple of attempts, but I didn't get a shot of it anyway. But that, you know, that's another example of how you start off doing one thing and go off onto another avenue. And, and that ability to get closer up and, and see things uh, closer is a really powerful thing and be really great, uh, particularly when you're sharing photos of, of your garden, things that you didn't even know were in there, which can be great. And the, this is another example of this really is, is uh, uh, waste disposal bin 
uh, out in the in uh, our row of houses and uh, a butterfly's created a cocoon there uh, and um, you know so you never know where you're going to start to see things and again this is this shot really is it shows you a couple of things it's about looking in places that you might not expect to see something and it's also again that no local knowledge so of, of the light and understanding the light so to get this shot i really wanted to have it like 90 percent of the day this bin is out of direct sunlight and um i really wanted to get it with the light catching it and separating it with a nice background dark background and um, so I knew that there was only a certain time of day where it would catch it. And, and, you know, that's that kind of local knowledge. That's a great thing about exploring on your own doorstep. If you were on holiday somewhere, you wouldn't know. You'd just take the photograph and move on to the next thing. But because this is in, uh, on your doorstep, you, you have the time to sort of understand and know that at this time of day, the light's going to be catching this and I'll come back and, and, and catch it on a sunny day when the light's coming down and get the shot that I wanted to get. Our approach and, and our perspective could be a real, uh, a really great thing to explore, sort of thinking about, it's very, so most of us, let me use my phone, most of us, and we're all guilty of it myself uh, from time to time, is just seeing something, oh look, there's a swab, and lifting the camera up in front of your face and taking a picture. But by thinking about things a little bit more, thinking about where do I want to take this photograph? Do I want to be eye level with this swan here uh, and get it and feel, feel that real sort of connection with it and feel close to it, it's close enough to trust me. All those kind of things and, and different viewpoints, get the reflection, all that kind of stuff. Thinking about that before you take the shot can be a really powerful experience and, and, and result in some photos that you're really happy with, like trying to photograph a bee from underneath and, and trying to get a silhouette of it uh, with the light coming from behind it. Those kind of things, getting down and on eye level with a bird that we're all really familiar with, but maybe see it from a new and different perspective. Or maybe it's a moment that you can freeze of a, you know, we all, we're all familiar with seeing pigeons flying around us, but if you can manage to freeze it in falling snow or in a situation that's not typical or not common, that can also be a great moment as well. So we're gonna move on now to um, another part, another thing that I look forward to every year and that is the arrival of our swifts and swifts are another bird uh, like the starlings in a lot of trouble i think it's um i'm trying to remember the number now it's about 50 something percent but since 1995 so the starlings were from uh nine, mid 70s so since 19 um 1995 over 50 uh, there's been an over 50 percent decline in our swift numbers in the UK and there are very similar issues possibly with insect numbers falling as well which the swifts predominantly eat. they hoover up the flies and the insects in the skies um, and uh, but a big challenge for them is nesting sites as the roofs and uh, they, they traditionally uh, nest in the eaves of roofs so the best thing to do for swifts is to put up swift nest box which we've got a few out on ours and um, there's a few swift organizations if you're interested in doing that i'd thoroughly recommend it because they're fantastic birds uh, really fast they can fly up to 70 miles an hour and they're just absolutely brilliant and stunning to watch and they'll arrive in the in uh, a few weeks uh, i think and uh, they'll leave in august so they're not here for very long but they're when they're here they're fantastic to um to watch uh, it's particularly when they first arrive, they make this real um, screeching, shrill sound as they fly around. And, and they really are quite dramatic birds and really enjoyable to watch. And a challenge to photograph as well. So they're not the easiest birds to photograph, but uh, it, like the bees and like capturing things in flight, the more of a challenge it is, the more I enjoy it. And, you know, you trying to photograph a swift you're going to have, uh, so here they are trying to investigate under the eaves here, trying to investigate a nest site, see if they can make a nest. 
And uh, but again, yeah. So once you get a sharp shot, a shot of a swift, you can be really, uh, uh, really pleased with yourself and and give yourself a pat on the back and a nice cup of tea and a biscuit or something. Um, so here, this shot's a, a little bit different here, uh, and and it's interesting when you get to experiment with things, you start to develop ideas. And this is a composite shot of uh, two swifts as they fly over. Uh, the roof. So I only did this. I've been watching Swiss for ages, but I only did this at the end of our row um, last year. And, and I quite like what I've done, but I think it needs a bit more work. So again, you kind of pick up on these ideas uh, and then you take them. And, and because Swiss are only here for a very short time, you have to wait another year until they come. So I'm really excited about them coming this year so I can develop some more ideas with the Swifts and, and planning can be a great thing. So, you know, thinking about these things and, and thinking, how do I make this better? How can I make this more interesting for other people to see? It can be a really great thing to do um, when you're exploring worlds on your own doorstep. And because you're exploring the world on your own doorstep, you have that luxury of, you know, right, there might be less Swifts, there might be less Starlings next year, but they will be here and I will have a chance to develop this shot idea and we all have a chance to develop this project and you can do that here you can't do that with other things like you know imagine if you um uh plan to you went for a weekend to uh, somewhere stunning like uh, oh I, don't, I can't think of anywhere but anyway you plan to do it again this year and last year it, that's two years maybe that you might not be able to get out there again uh, so that's the beauty of, of exploring your local area and, and, and photographing it. And as the summer comes to an end, as, it, as the August approaches, they all start to gather uh, and fly overhead and, um, and, 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 and then just before they move off. So they kind of get this kind of, uh, they almost like a swarm, I want to say, but swarm is a bit of a negative word, but they all flock together overhead and feed up and then get on their way. Uh, back and a few juveniles will still hang around and a few you'll just be a few lingerers um, and then before you know it they've kind of gone and disappeared and, and you don't realize until a day or two after where you stop hearing them and they're gone and uh, you know that you know that summer's starting to come to an end then but as well as our visitors uh, we also have um, lots of regulars and house sparrows kind of um, growing up in 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 Greater London in in, in a, a quite a fairly urban suburban area, um, I'm really familiar with sparrows, and and I've and I've included them here because there's a lot of birds I think we take for granted, and a lot of animals that we take for granted, and we should really sort of once you it's like the starlings once you you can get starlings everywhere once you start to get under the skin of these uh, this wildlife you start to notice things and they can become really absorbed with them and their world and and um you know sparrows are a great one to watch as well they're really interesting they barely stand still this so they're, they're actually quite tricky to photograph in a way blackbirds as well beautiful song um blackbirds absolutely love blackbirds and magpies are really beautiful they're shimmer um once you start looking at magpies in 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 detail they're really quite stunning uh, stunning birds if a little bit aggressive to some of the other birds. And I, I was saying the other day with a blue tit, you know, like, can you imagine never seeing a blue tit and you come over and you see a blue tit and we take them for granted so much here. You kind of almost dismiss them when they're on the bird feeder or if you're in a nature reserve and you see them around, oh, it's a blue tit. But they are absolutely stunning. These little birds that are just really, really quite beautiful. Yeah, great birds, blue tits. So, so whatever it is, uh, you know, it's funny. I think here where we are, uh, we get a lot of red kites, which would be really easy to take for granted. And uh, again, when I, when I lived in London, one of the things I, I really rue really is the how I took foxes, urban foxes, for granted. So many opportunities. I, I never ever bothered trying to photograph foxes when I, I was living um, back in uh, in London and. You know, I really, really wish I had because um, uh, I, I barely see any foxes these days uh, where, where we live here. Um, and it's the same for us, I think, with kites. They're, you know, part of the furniture almost, uh, but they're such big birds, they're stunning birds. So whatever it is that you experience on your doorstep, don't take it for granted. Photograph it. You see it as an opportunity to get to know it and try and photograph it in a really exciting way.
another great, uh, really stunning bird is the goldfinches that we get um, uh, around here. And they're just really, you know, they're just stunning birds, aren't they? Uh, and as well as the regulars, we kind of get some rare visitors as well. We get the, um, the pied wagtail. They quite often you get them, uh, they're an urban bird, but uh, around here they tend to stick to the rivers and, and, and around that way. And they will only come over here um, when the, maybe the river's flooded and there's not so much food around, they'll tend, tend winter time, they'll tend to come over here as well. So, so again, it's the, having that kind of intimate knowledge of the area around you, you start to see what's special, what's, what, what's an unusual visitor, what's, what, what's not. And, and the usual visitors, you get to understand them in, in, a, in a deeper way and photograph them in a better way. And, and the herons that fly past always quite impressive one of the biggest birds you can see in the sky flying towards you quite dramatic and wherever there's some sort of regular birds you're going to get some quite exciting visitors like a, a, a sparrowhawk female sparrowhawk here which is uh, you know a great um a, a very impressive thing to see uh, and lucky to photograph as well if you get a shot like that and I, I have to confess that this is a photo, well, it's still in the garden, obviously, but it's from my mum's garden, uh, a young fox coming into her garden there. And this is back on the terrace where we get some more cute visitors uh, like the hedgehogs. And the, the hedgehogs, if you can encourage hedgehogs into your garden, uh, particularly if you grow veg or anything like that, you know, getting a, having the chance uh, to let hedgehog into your garden. One, it's a really exciting thing seeing a hedgehog, but they'll also eat all your slugs and, and, and your snails as well. So they're gardener's best friend, hedgehogs. Um, uh, they're brilliant. So don't put slug pellets out because it's not very good for the hedgehogs, but uh, encourage them in and they'll, they'll do a much better job anyway. Um, really, really cool. But in a lot of trouble as well, hedgehogs, uh, I think most people know now that they're, they're in trouble. The best thing you can do is encourage them into your garden. Uh, and make sure there's some gaps in your fences and stuff so that they can get into your garden. But fantastic. So we're going to move on to uh, just go a little bit left field maybe and move on to the people. So, the, so I'm sharing stuff on my doorstep. And uh, I said at the very beginning of this talk, you know, we're part of nature. You know, we are a part of nature. So, you know, why wouldn't we include people and in our, in our, in our presence on this road, it would be crazy not to, right? And I think, you know, it's interesting. So ever since I started the project, way before lockdown, so two, uh, three or four years ago, maybe this, I started seeing the starlings outside and started photographing them and thinking about them. Um, I've always had this thing, oh, I need to photograph people. I need to capture the people of, uh, of the row. Um, and as a professional photographer, I photograph people all the time. And I think uh, as a result of that, in my personal photography, when I'm out with the camera on my own, I kind of prefer a bit of the solitude and, and the wildness a bit and, and avoiding that kind of human interaction. And, and uh, so as a result, I never really, I always put it off and I didn't really photograph anyone. But lockdown kind of gave you, gave a different opportunity uh, really to kind of, actually connect with people and you know even though we're sort of staying in isolation you can still say hello to your neighbor over your fence and I think one of the things with lockdown it probably has created this kind of uh thing where you kind of avoid people maybe and 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 you can still there's nothing wrong with talking to people and saying oh let's have it can I take a quick shot of you because you know here you're at a safe distance and you can take that picture of your neighbor out in the garden and that that interaction can be so important as well it's so easy to sort of just close yourself off and and then you know i think uh, i said to someone the other day um it's that kind of thing where you kind of you have days where you just don't want to speak to someone and you try and avoid having to talk to someone or I do anyway other people are different aren't they um and then you kind of almost force that interaction and you feel so much better as a result of that interaction quite often when you're in that kind of space uh, so don't be afraid to take yourself out of your comfort zone photograph a friend obviously ask them can I take a picture of you and you you know nine nine and a half times out of ten that's a positive experience and you get to uh, you know, have that bit of interaction, which I think is so important uh, at the moment as well. 
but it's not just about your interaction it's about photographing how people are interacting with that space around you as well um, and so those shots were of um the the first lockdown we had the the second lockdown in november or december i can't even remember but the winter lockdowns anyway you know it's a very different feel it's darker it's wintry and i wanted to just document that on our road just to get that idea of the darker nights the longer nights and and, and people staying in their homes a little bit more as well uh, and again obviously from a safe distance um taking those photographs but it's a good thing to do so and it's an interesting avenue again it's that following those avenues of thoughts um quite often i'm quite good at just sort of having these ideas and, and then then just uh, almost taking the picture in my head and then sitting down <laughs> having a cup of tea or whatever but the, if you can force yourself to do it just say right i'm going to go and do this uh nine times out of ten ten times out of ten you're going to feel so much better as a result of it so one of the things um that i did over the first lockdown in the summer i bought myself a solitary bee nest box and you can see my wife and uh, my youngest son there um watching a solitary bee come in now there's 270 species of bee in the uk so there's a lot of species to try and capture and 250 of those are solitary bees so that can be uh, a really um good fun thing trying to uh, you know not only see them and try and identify them usually i identify them after i've taken a photograph they're quite hard to identify at the time in situ but uh, but it's about encouraging them into your local area as well so you don't uh, so having a nest box for birds but also for insects can be really awarded and here's one coming in to our um, nest box here um, with Alfie, our lurcher, in the background there as it comes in. And I think, yes, so I've got a picture here. Here's one coming in, but you can also see one. Oh, back. You, you, you've got a lovely little window where you can see the nest chambers that the, the bees are creating here, which can be a really uh, exciting thing for the kids and for me to, to see. It's just really, so this is what they would do uh, in a tree. Uh, or a little crevice somewhere and they, they they would be laying their little chambers there and you don't have to have one with a window you can get really inexpensive ones that you can just put uh, made out of sort of almost bamboo I think or, or little tubes that you can put out in your garden and you can photograph them as they come in and the great thing about like that with that flower um, at the uh, in the earlier slide where you focus on the flower and wait for the bee to come in you can do the same thing here with the bees coming into the entrance and of course, you can encourage butterflies. So, as some, so we're not going to see many butterflies now. Maybe some waking up from hibernation on the warmer days. Maybe some in your sheds and in your house. The hibernating ones, the overwintering ones, wake up from time to time. Um, but what you can do now is you can get plants in the garden that are going to attract them. Um, Buddleia is a fantastic, uh, which is what this um, peacock butterflies on here is. It's a fantastic attractor. For butterflies putting what so this is a bird bath that I've got here and it's you know you you can attract birds into the garden with a bird bath but you can also uh, attract insects as well with that water and uh, maybe the most underappreciated insect um, uh, around is the wasp but look how stunning that is that's just a beautiful uh, creature and I think you know the the fear of wasps is it's a little bit too much I think and uh, the the, the I'll, well, I'll show you how close I got to one in a minute but uh, I mean that's pretty close as well the reality is with wasps while they're nesting they are really uninterested in, in people it's only when they get to the if they feel trapped or threatened or like you know I had one stuck up my t-shirt once and that that was I got stung there but that was because it was trapped um, but but normally they're totally fine to uh, look at and photograph and it's only when the nests uh, are finished or over and um, the worker bees sort of go out and drink fermented fruit and sort of fight with each other or whatever so uh, so don't be scared of wasps they're fantastic creatures and so I said there was 200 and 70 species of bees there are 7,000 species 
of wasps in the UK. Um, this is parasitic wasp, but I can't pronounce the Latin for it, I'm afraid. But but 7,000 wasps in the UK, what a project that would be to try and photograph all, all the wasps. So there's so much stuff when you scratch the surface, you start to see. And they use these um, uh, long abdomen, like, look like tails to inject their eggs into um, rather maybe I shouldn't have started that for actually <laughs> if you're a bit squeamish anyway so there, there, you would have seen something like that if you watch the um, uh, David Attenborough you'll, you'll know what, what uh, some of these parasitic wasps do but they're fantastic creatures and, and very exciting so we did have a wasp nest at the end of our row this year which I really enjoyed um, trying to get some photos a good challenge again trying to get wasps in flight then they're, they're faster than bees where they're flying around and they're hunting insects and bringing insects back. So they're good for pest control as well, wasps. Uh, and a real exciting challenge to try and photograph. And here I've photographed them with uh, a big wide angle lens uh, as they're going in and coming out of the nests. And um, so I'm actually pretty close here to the wasps and I've got, um, they're not too keen on, on mammal breath and human breath. So I've got, a, I've actually got a mask on. Um, which is no different from going out now anyway but uh, uh but yeah they're they're fantastic uh really exciting things to photograph so bold uh their colors uh very good so i'm coming to an end now if you've put your questions on uh, as i said uh put the comments on i'm not seeing them at the moment i need to get a little bit more used to doing these live video feeds uh thanks for joining me uh but put the comments any questions and i will answer the, uh, them uh, when I got off this video and I had a cup of tea, I think, um, uh, really. But the, yeah, so this is coming to an end. But I think what I wanted to try and get across, which I've hopefully got across, the more you interact, the more you look at, the closer you look at it, the more you, you change how you look at your local environment, the more you're going to get out of it. And, and the more you persevere with that, trying to get a shot, whether it's the timing, whether it's the view, whether it's the composition, uh, but the more you do it and the more you kind of, the deeper you forge that connection with what's on your doorstep, the more satisfied you're going to be with your photographs and the more, the better position you are going to be in to capture something special and capture something unique, which you will find, I guarantee you will find really inspiring and uplifting. So thanks so much for joining me. I'll say it into the camera. I've been looking at the screen all this time, but thanks again. Bear with me. I'm going to be doing one of these talks every week for a few weeks uh, with a, a few other others phone in, and um, hopefully they'll go a little bit smoother than today. But thanks again, and I will uh, see you again, hopefully, next week.